You're gonna love this interview. Just got done editing it. I'm glad I got it live for you. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes hanging out, answering any questions you have. In fact, leave a comment below about data points or what you think is gonna happen to the company and I will respond to every comment. Additionally, if you're just loving the content, click the thumbs up and I will go and check out your profile as well and give your videos some love as well. In the meantime, enjoy the interview. Hello everyone, my guest today is Adam Campaign. He's the founder and CEO of Clear Metal. Before Clear Metal, he spent five years at Google launching their geo-commerce technology and 19 years as the executive director of Send, a nonprofit he started. He holds five technology patents, two degrees from the University of Michigan and an MBA from Stanford. All right, Adam, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so what does Clear Metal do and what's your guys' revenue model? How do you make money? Sure, we are an enterprise SaaS company, so pure SaaS revenue model. Uh, and what we do is we're actually solving the problem uh, in global supply chains, where the largest retailers and brands are feeling like the Amazon effect is pushing them and their supply chains to a point where those supply chains can no longer perform uh, in terms of delivering products around the world to the customers that need them. Um, and it's not being made any easier because the data and systems and methodology used in supply chain historically is largely static. And so our belief and our solution is that uh, the winning companies are going to treat transportation like the continuously evolving system that it actually is. And what they need to make that happen is a technology platform and solution set like ours that helps them continuously plan for global transportation and freight needs, continuously monitor as inventory is moving around the world and shipping containers on ships, trains, and trucks, um, and continuously resolve issues that inevitably come up as you're moving billions of dollars of inventory around the globe with a uh, pretty complex logistics ecosystem. So Adam, who, who's actually paying you? Is it the e-commerce seller that's shipping 20,000 units of shoes in the next cargo container from you know Taiwan to LA? Yeah, it's the big brands, uh, retailers, suppliers, and manufacturers. So really it's any company and some of the largest that you'd imagine that have a raw material like a, a wood pulp or a rubber material or plastic or oil um, all the way to finished goods like clothing, apparel, shoes, like you mentioned, that's making its way from a factory or mill overseas into a distribution center or warehouse or a retail store or an e-commerce site that you and I buy off of. Okay. So give me a, give me a sweet spot here on average. What do one of these customers pay you per year to use your technology and why do they pay you that? What are they getting? Yeah, sure. So typically we're looking at, uh, six figures and seven figure contracts. Typically we're looking at I'd say low to often mid six figures and then, um, you know, low seven figures per year. The reason the value of the product is so high is obviously because of the value we provide. What we're tapping into is the ability to make customer facing decisions. So if you're a big industrial supplier producing uh, a material that goes into, I don't know, Unilever or Procter & Gamble's supply chain, we're talking about a lot of material and value. So what we help these companies do is make more intelligent decisions about how to distribute that product into a business or into a consumer's hands. And that's on the order of you know multiple billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of inventory. So in short, not to ramble here, we make better decisions. We help them make better decisions for customer service purposes and actually for inventory management. What I mean is lowering the amount of excess buffer stock that you have to keep on hand to make sure that your shelves and e-commerce sites are full uh, making different, more efficient transportation decisions. So you can ship, let's say, more by an ocean-going vessel than spending money to ship by air. And then you actually make your whole supply chain team a lot more productive because they're able to manage issues as inventory moves in a more efficient manner. So Adam, would you say $300,000 a year is a fair sweet spot for you guys then? Um, sure, it's a sweet spot. We have deals in that range, but higher uh, pretty often as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and by the way, everyone has obviously power economics, right? There's two customers that make up a lot of your thing. There's also really small kind of users, but I want to get in the sweet spot just because we're short on time. So if that, let's say, let's say someone is paying you $300,000 per year, what are you pricing against? Like what's the, what are, is like, what's the utility metric? Is it, is it pounds of things shipped or number of cargo shipments or dollars saved or what? Yeah. So our pricing model is basically a, um, a fixed platform fee for all the services we provide across that planning uh, monitoring and resolution capability. And then the variable fee comes in with the volume of shipments that they have globally. So if you're a company that is moving a lot more inventory than less. Measured by a, what though? SKUs, weight, containers? Uh, it depends in which category we're serving, but the easiest way to think about it is amount of containers full of shipments. So containers. 
Okay. If you're importing, you know, 10,000 containers a year or 100,000 containers a year, that's where your price might be a little bit different in tier, but there's still that base platform fee for all the underlying data science and ML and services we provide. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And that base fee, is it the same no matter how much you're shipping or do you have stages as well? You can get like the less features, the, the middle features or all the features and there's different price points on that base as well. At the moment, we actually have a fully loaded product. That's a standard uh, tiered base rate. Okay. So on someone paying you $300,000 per year, how much of that is going to be that fixed rate just to unlock everything? Um, we, uh, so you're talking about percentage or absolute? Uh, whatever you're comfortable sharing. I'm just trying to get a sense of what's the, if again, if someone's paying you 300,000 bucks per year, are you talking like a hundred thousand dollar base, no matter if they ship nothing or 10 hundred million units or. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, typically, you know, we're talking probably, uh, call it 50, 60% of the fee would be a fixed. And the variable component is often a lesser component of that. Okay. Let me, let me see if I got that right. So of $300,000 spend with you guys, you're saying 50 to 60% of that will be fixed. And then the other 50, 40 to 50% will be variable. Uh, that's exactly right. Yep. Okay. So this flat fee to unlock everything is variable across every customer account. Say again, Nathan, that flat, flat that flat fee that every customer pays is variable across every customer account based off the total projected volume that year. No. So, well, let me clarify what I'll share is look, we have a tiered SaaS pricing model, which is pretty typical. And then the two components, the larger portion of that annual subscription fee, call it 50, 60% is going to be that fixed rate, depending on your tier as a customer. I see. You, okay. That's what I was asking. In other words, you don't charge every customer, no matter what, a hundred thousand dollars per year to unlock everything. Even if they ship nothing, what you're doing is seeing what category they're in. And then there's economic split, you know, 50, 50 ish between the flat fee plus the, you know, number of cargo, full cargo containers shipped that year. Yeah, that's basically right. But just to be extra clear, there is no customer we have today that does not play, does not pay a fixed platform fee for all the services we provide. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. That's helpful. Okay. Let's get your backstory here. When did you launch the company or, or when was the first like, line of code written? Sure. We, uh, at the turn of 2015, so call it 2015 is when we founded the company. Okay. And when did you get your first dollar of revenue? Uh, let me think actually right about that time. So we were, uh, kind of lightweight prototyping incorporated the company because we had our first trial customer at that point willing to pay dollars and we couldn't have been personally reliable. We needed a corporation behind it. Okay, wait. So just to be clear, you wrote the first line of code in 2015 and actually collected in your bank the first dollar of revenue in the same year for a complex piece of technology like what you guys had to build to make this work? Uh, it's correct. I mean, it, it's certainly not as complex as it, is, as it is today. But yeah, we were under a commercial contract with first dollars collected within the first year we wrote code. Yes. Okay, that's pretty great. That, I mean, that's great. So, I mean, have you been able to bootstrap this then or have you guys raised capital? So we raised capital. In 2015, we were actually founding the company out of Stanford's business and engineering schools, with my two co-founders. Um, and we were bootstrapping at that point for probably nine months, close to a year, before raising our first round of capital. We've now gone through three rounds of capital with a total investment of around $25 million or so. Adam, that's a lot of dilution. Why did you have to raise so much? Um, I, honestly, for what we're building, I don't see it as that... Uh, that much. Well, um, everyone would say that. <laughs> <laughs> everyone would, no, in all seriousness, why couldn't you keep being scrappy, keep pulling contracts forward, keep pulling annual pricing forward? Why, why'd you have to sell part, part of the company? Uh, a couple of reasons. I mean, first, what we're building um, is complex. It requires a lot of investment. We're solving a 30 year old problem that hasn't been fixed yet. That requires you know, high caliber talent, in the data science world, and some very sophisticated folks on the commercial side. The second reason is um, we're selling into some of the most complex and largest organizations on the planet. And so we have to invest uh, to build and develop what is proven to be valuable prior to, um, you know, really expanding. No, our, but that's our, not true because you got your first customer with nothing. It was, it, you got your first, that's why I asked the question. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, the point, the, the reality is um, we're, I think here's really the, the root of it. We're trying to build a very big company. And while we could have, to your point, simply gone about it the same way when we were bootstrapping before capital, fat, we have experienced faster growth as a result of taking in more capital. And I think there's a larger valuation in company as a result. Yeah. 
Yeah, by the way, I'm pushing here because this is always a balance, totally. right? I just, I, it drives me crazy when people, uh, when when people discredit bootstrappers by saying, I think I'm building a bigger opportunity, therefore I'm raising. I think there's a, you have to bet and hope that the money you raise does actually drive growth. Otherwise you end up as the next Blue Apron, right? <laughs> totally, yeah. And I think this is a great point, honestly. The, I mean, look at what we're doing today, right? We are investing and, you know, um, yeah, investing hev- you know, heavily in broader expansion in Europe from a, a personnel footprint perspective. We are investing with high conviction around building kind of the next product and feature set because we believe that that will help us increase the annual sales price, ASP, um, and get a broader customer set than our you know, targets today. What's the so team that- size today? How many people? Today we are um, about four, uh, approaching 50, about 40 today. Okay, 40. And what's the breakdown? How many engineers? Uh, about half the company is in the development side. Okay, and how many quota carrying reps? Quota carrying reps, um, we've got uh, today between five and ten, and we're hiring actively right now. How'd you figure that model out? How'd you get your first sale hire done? What pro forma did you put them on? What was the kind of the bookings a new bookings AR target? Yeah, I think you know typical for our kind of stage and size SaaS. You know, as we move forward, you know, reps carry anywhere between a million or two million uh, per year. Um, we figured, how did we figure that out? Um, some experience, some advisory, you know, following pretty typical SaaS models in our view. Yep. And will their full earnings at OT be something like 250 grand or about one fourth of the, of the kind of the ARR target? Um, you're asking pointed and great questions. Yeah. We're pretty in line with typical SaaS rep. Uh, yeah. Then obviously looking for quota to, uh, or sorry, coverage to quota, uh, or quota to coverage of about three, four X what we're looking for in terms of um, what we're looking to hit revenue wise. Yeah. Yeah. Some people call it salesperson profitability. Some people call it, you know, OT to, you know, to, to ARR ratio, whatever you want, coverage ratio, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that math works, right? That math works, which is important. Um, okay. Uh, tell me about the first customer. So you, how'd you have an inside scoop with them? How'd you get them to commit to paying you money up front when you had nothing? Yeah, sure. So the company actually evolved quite a bit. We started, uh, selling our software to the logistics providers themselves prior to us evolving the business to sell to the brands and suppliers whose goods are being carried by those logistics providers. So think of big companies like Maersk that have ships and containers. That's where it started. We evolved to the biggest companies, you know, you know, just as an example, a company like Nike or Home Depot or big physical uh, businesses. Um, so anyway, the first customer, uh, the company was founded after some time I spent over in Hong Kong at one of these logistics providers during business school. I came back with a general in, uh, insight and uh, understanding of a problem space they were experiencing about moving assets around the world with a uh, uh, kind of low predictability. And then my two co-founders and I went at the problem um, to really address it and see what we could solve. Uh, we had built up um, general understanding of the problem through interviewing folks in the industry uh, gained a good vernacular and, and understanding of the underlying dynamics of the problem and had basically a, a, a lightweight prototype hypothesis on how we could solve it. So through relationships, really cold calling, we found our first customer to work with um, and work with them on an early prototype, first lines of code, little mock-ups, and see if we can technically solve the problem before we then determine whether this is a, um, a nice to have or a big strategic need. Yep. No, that's, I mean, that's obviously a good way to do it. So th- that was your first customer back in 2015 and then update us today, four years later, how many customers are you working with? Yeah. So we're working, uh, we have dozens of customers I'll share. Um, they are across 10 verticals, industry verticals and actually sit across four continents. Um, and again, some of the largest kind of fortune 500, or if you look at, you know, Gartner's top 25 supply chains, we're engaged and working with, uh, about 25% of those top supply chains. Sorry, Gartner is um, what? what? What's it called? Yeah, Gartner has a listing every year of the top 25 supply chains in the world. Oh, okay. Um, and if you look at that list, you know, the big companies, Apple, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, folks like this. Um, and, you know, we've evolved quite a bit, evidence being um, not only did Gartner name us a cool vendor and AI supply chain, but a quarter of all those top supply chains have actually engaged us for further help on digitizing their their supply chain. Good. Well, I mean, that's six or seven right there, a quarter of 25. And if you say a couple dozens, we'll just assume a north of 24 is fair today, correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's good. Now, can I multiply that times that, that ARPU you gave me earlier, $300,000 a year, that puts you at about $600,000 a month in revenue or north of that today? I'd say, uh, yeah, we, um, what I'll say is this, because it gets touchy with revenue as a private company. We 
we're actually very healthily on the track for Series B. Um, and I think you, know, you can call out generally what those metrics look like. Um, I don't know, actually. I mean, what, what would you say those are? I'd say, I mean, I'd say companies around Silicon Valley and SaaS, we're seeing anywhere between, um, you know, five to 12 million of ARR annual recurring revenues per year is typically that striking point of uh, Series B, which would be, you know, 20 to 40 million of additional capital should you want to grow the company with that new trajectory. So, I mean, we have, what, two, three months left in this year. I mean, do you feel good about breaking the 5 million mark by the end of this year? I feel good about where we're looking to go. We're trying to in the next, I'd say, depending on how we want to pace it within the next year, raising that Series B. Um, and for us, it's really a determination of uh, in an early but you know growing, transforming market, when do we want to step on the gas? And based on our kind of commercial traction and revenues and unit economics that we understand and can repeat, when do we want to really throw fuel on the fire? So yeah. that's kind of how we're forming the wings a little bit. But do, but to be on pace to do that next year, I mean, do you feel like the number, you know, to finish this year out, you got to get above like five or, or is it more like seven, eight, nine, ten? Honestly, we're trying to get as high as we can, as quick as we can. I think, um, you know, look, if we're trending, if we want to do a series B end of next year and we're hitting, you know, eight by eight by end of year, that's way ahead of pace. We'll pull the series B forward. Yeah. If, um, you know, we're trending lighter and there's some big contracts in the works, we'll pace it back, but we're totally, uh, uh, looking pretty good, actually. That's good. That's good. So we'll, we'll, we'll put like you give us a nice range, right? So 24 customers, maybe more like $15,000 a month is a more, a more fair average, right? So something more in the kind of, you know, four or $5 million run rate today or by the end of the year with hopes to get up to that, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 mark by the end or mid next year. So you can do that series B is a, is a fair statement. I'm not, I'm not going deep right now. We got, we got investors and folks that uh, may want to invest on the line. Although I am comforted because I know this will air far after where we are today. Yeah. But uh, I think within the guidelines we're talking, yeah, we're, we're looking pretty strong. Yeah. I just, I mean, I, I just still, you know, being, you know, modeling everything off, like getting to like the next round of capital to me, just, it seems so silly, especially a creative guy like you, you've shown you can pull cash forward with nothing. It's just like, why not keep trying to do that? You're going to take another 15, 20% dilution, raising 20 to 40 million with, you know, 10 million in ARR. Yeah. I guess it's just a decision you want to make. No, it's actually, it's a great point. I, you know, I think, um, there are a couple of other factors that we're working with, right? You know, one is again, uh, well, I don't think this industry is a win or take all. I think there are a few, going to be a few significant players that really go the distance. And we obviously intend to be one of them. I think given that there is competition, whether perceived or real. And when I look at that, we're saying, Hey, at what point do we really want to step on the gas and how much market share do we want to take? Now you're right that we can contract customers in the seven figures that funds us in a really nice way. But when we're dealing in a early and fast changing market with a, um, the window wide open to kind of be the, the player in that space uh, and competition. We have to think about how do we continue to develop maybe even further than we would if we were just trying to be uh, customer funded. Yeah. I mean, look, all that's fine. All this is fine as long as growth is there, right? So, I mean, if you're like, if you're flirting with 400 ish a month today, right? I mean, do you, a year ago, were you less than $200,000 a month? Do you have more than 100% year over year growth? Yeah. We're, I mean, we're looking at uh, uh, probably 4X uh, year over year. Oh, okay. I mean, so you're doing like a hundred grand a month a year ago than if you're floating with 400 today. 400% growth. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, why, why, sorry, why do you, isn't that the same thing? Well, I'm just trying not to give you the exact run rate we were at now and then. That's oh, 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 that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, look, I mean, we, we, can, we can get an estimate, right? You told us dozens of customers. So minimum is going to be 24, right? At like a fifteen or $20,000 a month price point. I mean, that puts us in. I mean, we're talking about a delta here of you being vague to the tune of like, maybe it's a little as three or as much as five, right? It's, you're not being that vague, right? It is what it is. True, true. <laughs> so that's still healthy growth, right? So did most of that growth come from expanding accounts or adding new accounts altogether? Good question. I don't know the exact breakdown, um, but every account we have renewed and most often expanded. Um, I'd say the the l much larger percentage is obviously new, given we came. You know, we really had a breakout year in 2018 after finding product market fit, and um, most of the growth has been new. Yeah. How? Co I mean, with what you've raised, you have to burn capital to try and drive growth. But how much burn can you stomach? I mean, are you cool with like 300, 400 grand a month right now, or you want to try and keep it lower? We, I mean, honestly, we're, we're trying to burn as much cash so long as it drives value and growth for us. So we would be cool even higher than those amounts, um, you know, as long as it's, it's driving revenue activity. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that about where you're at right now? I mean, how much are you burning right now per month? 
<laughs> I can't go here with you. Um, uh, I think, I mean, you could do the math also, right? Right. We have a team of, uh, you know, call it 40 approaching 50 and are hiring aggressively. Um, and you know what it takes to support the customers and in a SaaS business, right? Most of our, uh, most of our burn is going to be around personnel. Yeah, Adam, you could just make this easy for us. It's okay. I mean, you raise capital. Typically people raise for 18 to 24 months of burn. That would put your burn today at around 400, 500 grand a month in that range. Generally in that range. Perfect. Sure. All right. Last question before we wrap up. Churn's critical in a SaaS company. So when you look at your gross revenue churn past 12 months, what have you kept that down to? Say again, gross revenue. Gross revenue churn past 12 months. Ah, uh, so actually we're looking pretty um, solid there. 80% of folks that we engage with in a phase one deployment, actually 85% convert to full subscription contracts in the event that we have to do trials. Beyond that, um, churn, we have not to date had a customer churn after subscribing to our software. What about downgrade revenue? They don't have to churn. They, if they pay a dollar less, it's a dollar churn. Um, we have not had any downgraded revenue. Okay. So no gross revenue churn to date and expansion year over year looks like about what? Correct. No, no, uh, no churn, no gross churn and expansion looks, are you talking about the 400% growth? We're looking no, no, at that's data? total business. I'm talking about just the core that signed up a year ago, right? Ignore new customers. The customers that signed up a year ago, what did they expand to uh, year over year? Um, the numbers are going to be really skewed. We had a few that really, um, jumped up. Um, well, don't other, do it on a logo basis though, Adam. So if you had a, if you had a, if you had a year ago, you had a million dollars, uh, well, let's just say $300,000 a month in revenue, ignore new customer ads. If that 300,000 went to 330,000, right. You can do the math in terms of what the expansion was. Uh, true. I'm not really trying to hide much. The, the reason, so I'd say generally the easy number, it looks like about 30% growth in existing accounts. The challenge I have is we have a lot of Q4 renewals. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. And then uh, last question, fully weighted CAC to get one of these new kind of $200,000 a year accounts. Are you, are you comfortable spending first year ACV? Um, we would be. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the growth and expansion that we're seeing. Yep. Makes sense. All right. Famous five, number one, favorite business book. Um, famous business book, uh, uh, managing, uh, what's it called? Having hard conversations, managing hard conversations. I forget the title. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, continues to be Eric Schmidt. Uh, number three, what is your favorite online tool for building your company? Give me a second. Um, calendar and getting events off of that calendar. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, I'd say six. And situation, married, single kids? Uh, engaged. Congratulations. That's exciting. <laughs> All right. And no kids? No kids. No kids. All right. And how old are you? Uh, I am 33. 33. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Ooh, um, this would be an exhilarating road and uh, a hard one. So buckle up and um, remember to have fun along the ride. Guys, there you have it. Clearmetal.com growing about 4X year over year. Uh, they raised about $25 million to do that. Again, AI for global supply chain and freight transportation systems. Uh, 40 folks on the team right now burning between four and $500,000 per month as they drive growth. Again, healthy growth, flirting with and hoping to get to that five to kind of $10 million run rate mark before thinking about doing any kind of Series B. Serving about 24 or north of 24 customers. They are dozens of customers founded in 2015. Those price points somewhere in the call at 200 to 400 to $500,000 kind of per year range with some outliers and the seven figures as well. Adam, thank you for taking us to the top. Thanks. As you guys know, I fight like heck to get these data points for you from the CEOs that rarely do these kinds of shows. If you want more shows like this, make sure you subscribe right now. We're trying to get 10,000 YouTube subscribers by the end of September here, 2019. And it would mean the world to me if you clicked now to subscribe. Additionally, I've got two more great interviews for you. If you want more data points from the world's leading SaaS CEOs, click and watch one of them right now.